Hi, it's Kevin Sharp here for Fanbase Press. I'm joined by writer Jim Zub and editor Matt Murray for the new Conan the Barbarian from Titan Comics. Gentlemen, thank you for joining us. It's my pleasure. Absolute pleasure. So my first question is, this is a character with a long history, novels, movies, comic books, even Amigo doll back in the day. That's I'm wondering, what was your, both of your first introduction to Conan? Um, so my older brother's sort of my proto-nerd for almost all my fandom, so whether that's fantasy and sci-fi or comic books, uh, animation, even video games, a lot of that came from my older brother. He was reading the, the Frazetta covered, um, the Lancer paperbacks, and then he got into the comics as well. And I don't quite remember, I was very young, the Conan movie was out there and we probably rented it, you know, watched it that first time, way too young for an R-rated film. And it absolutely blew my mind because it was the kind of dark and intense fantasy that we had imagined when we would play Dungeons and Dragons or things like that. The best soundtrack ever, crazy visceral action. And that just in, imprinted on me in that sense of this is what adventure and action is supposed to be like. These are the kinds of stakes. These are the sorts of, of threats. And uh, it was very formative, absolutely, 100%. Uh, I have a far worse horror story. <laughs> <laughs> I was five years old when the movie was released, <laughs> and my parents, uh, for some reason, because you know it was 1982, who really knew, uh, thought it was appropriate to uh, have a nice family outing at the movies. <laughs> and um, they took me and my brother to go see the 1982 Conan the Barbarian film, at which point my five-year-old personage started to cry, scream, and weep as Conan's parents' heads were removed in front of them. And I was forcibly removed from the theater as well I should have been because I never really should have been there in the first place, but it was the 80s. It was a good time. Uh, I did watch the movie later in life, so I mean that always serves as an entry point to me. But then, you know, you, go in, you get into, you get older, you start reading and Robert E. Howard stuff and really getting into that stuff. So. Um, but my actual first point was, you know, having to be removed from the film. From the film. Nice. Yeah. And I guess the less said about Conan the Destroyer, the better we can just move on. <laughs> I think it, well, here's the thing. The way I've always described, uh, you know, Conan is that most fantasy is high fantasy or, or you know, and, and Conan is low fantasy. It is this dark survivalist kind of stake. There's a a bit more of this um, mysterious and deadly quality to it, and the unknown is such a huge part of it. And I feel like Destroyer tries to make a more high fantasy attack, and it, that's why it's less successful. There's a bunch of reasons why, whether it's special effects or things like that, but um, it doesn't feel as visceral, it doesn't feel as intense, and it doesn't feel like the stakes and danger is as clear. And that's why I think the first one's stronger as a film. And in the original, in the spirit of the original Pulp Tales, too, like those are vicious, you know, intense kind of stories where morally gray and, and, you know, much harder choices for these characters to make. And so that's, yeah, it sort of loses its way as a film, but it's in some ways a good lesson that, that you don't even have to hew too far to sort of fall outside the lines. And you also have Grace Jones and Andre the Giant dressed as, uh, as Dagon. <laughs> so, I mean, that's, if, if you're written for that. Because, I mean, that's what it was about, right? right? I mean, it was just like, it was, you know, there were some puppets out there. They were, go, they were chasing yeah, the Yeah, I think they were. Off. There's some neat bits for sure, right? And what's interesting is to see within those limitations. I love the physical sets and I love the, um, the special effects. The, the, the blue screeny stuff is really corny. But, you know, when you do have the suits and you've got the thing, I think you can, you can do. It's, everyone is invested because they know it's real. One of the problems with all the CG stuff is there's an unreality to it that was undeniable, you know? Yeah. Yeah. So coming to a new number one after this long history with the character, sure. you as the writer, how do you find your own way in right. rather than just retreading You've the You've got to go back to the source. You have to understand why this character has a 90-year legacy. He is literally the original sword and sorcery character. Like Robert E. Howard created a genre because of the popularity of this character. He didn't name it sword and sorcery. I think Clark Ashton Smith or, or Fritz Leiber actually came up with the terminology, but but he pioneered this idea of this semi-historical, you know, concept of, of danger and magic and all this kind of stuff. That it's not Lovecraftian because it was they were contemporaries, but that feeling of horror and the unknown and all that kind of stuff. And so for me, it's first about understanding why the thing is important and why it set such a high bar. If you read the original Weird Tales, there's a reason why Lovecraft and Howard are the two standout authors 
in almost every issue, their work is head and shoulders over everyone else's. Why? Great atmosphere, visceral stakes. They're short stories that are punchy and powerful and they don't waste a lot of time, but there's a feeling of that wider world and there's a feeling of an existing mythology rather than it just being like plot points to be hit. And I think that's what's really cool about it. So for me, it's always, every commercial project I work on is, is steeped in research. And that's not because I want to copy what's been done before, but I want to understand a through line of entertainment and re-answer for myself, why do I love this thing? Because if I can address that and understand it, then I can put it into the stories. I, all the time we hear from people like, oh, there's so much Conan, how do you start, how do you get into it? And I think to myself, it's easier than any superhero. All you need to know is, you don't even have to know any of the detail. You don't have to know any of the gods. You don't have to know any of the places. Conan lives in a prehistory of our world. It's dangerous. The magic is mysterious. This guy has made a choice to wander and uh, understand, you know, find a wider world of adventure. Wherever he goes, exciting stuff happens. Jump in. There's other stuff that happens, of course, and there's, but you don't need to know that to come in the door. Editorially, I mean, if you're going to come to an issue one, it is literally a gift to have somebody like Jim oh, thanks, on board Cheers. because he has history with the character. Yeah. Um, I mean, he is right now the leading sword and sorcery guy. And Thank you. I get to play with that. Like, yeah. And he and I have been talking for like almost over a year now. Yeah, yeah. Right? The building and process has been extensive. It's, yeah. You know, he, you know, when we decided at Heroic Signatures, the company I work for, uh, we own the rights. And then we decided that we were going to get into publishing our own comics, and we partnered with Titan, and Titan was probably one of the best choices we could possibly make. Uh, I mean, they're bringing stuff to it that, you know, they're bringing experience that we don't have as a creative side. Right. But also they're allowing us to use the property, what I feel is properly. And we're all fans. Like, yeah. uh, you know, Nick Landau and the rest of the crew at, at Titan we've all grown up with this character and we all love the Hyborian age in the world. We all want to do right by it. And it's not to say that that hasn't been the case on other times that I've even written Conan, but I think there's a clarity there yeah. and we can look and go, look, this is a very unique opportunity. We're hitting the ground with a new number one and that isn't to uh, change everything. It is to focus attention in terms of what are the absolute most intrinsic qualities of the character in the history. How can we make it as entertaining and engaging as possible? and please ourselves as fans and the amazing legacy in comics that, that the book has had while also clearing kind of the chaff and saying, you get this, you're gonna get that perfect entryway. And because he's such a fan, yeah. it's fundamental that. And then, um, you know, he was, he was gonna be the writer. And then um, I was like, well, who do you want to draw it? And he gave me a list of names. Top name is Rob. Rob Dilatory. And I think Rob, the, the alchemy of Rob and Jim. Yeah. And if you know, bring this combined kind of energy, the, this the pulp force. aesthetic, and and for it's, me, we yeah. get to create, recreate this world, and and it feels so lived in. Yeah, and it's familiar, but it's so new and vibrant and, yep. and visceral. These cats are I, putting out. I hot joke that madness. that that Rob is like doing these Renaissance paintings of death. Like it's <laughs> it, there's a beauty to it, and there's an intensity to it. And the qualities, it feels like I'm discovering it for the first time and how excited I would be to open up an old issue of Savage Sword and the forbidden kind of fruit quality of how violent and intense it was. And when we see a reader here at the show just coming by our booth and we say, hey, there's a new Conan comic, and they take two flips and they go, oh, man. And they'll literally, the people that are with them, you got to check this out, check this out, check this out. You, we're not moving one copy at a time. We're moving everyone who sees it. They realize there's something special here, and I feel really, you know, that we've got something incredibly special. I am a fan and I want to do right by this property. We are all fans. Rob wants to deliver this incredible kind of tapestry of what is possible in this you know, world. And um, we're ta tackling it as a writing uh, challenge for me, it's very different. Normally I write full script, which is here's page one, panel one, here's what you do. Here's the sound effects or here's the captions or here's the dialogue. And we took a different approach. Rob is a complete artist package, and he's very confident in his storytelling. So we went back to an old school approach. It's what they used to call the Marvel method or outline style. So I'm writing, here's what happens on these pages broadly. You use as many or as few panels as you need to deliver that. <clears throat> then I'll dialogue it up. 
It's one thing to be writing a caption in your head and go, I think it's going to look like this. And then you get the finished art and you go, yeah, it's pretty close. It's another thing to have an entirely finished book in front of me and I go, I am writing to that exact panel. I'm writing to that exact expression. I am filling these areas with as much powerful prose as I can to live up to this guy's art. And Rob's art is a gift. It is a phenomenal. Also, Jim and I speak every week. Yeah, we are. Like yeah. an hour, two hours. And literally, we just sit there and <laughs> giggle. Yeah. And with like get, unmitigated glee. Like, yep. Check this out. Check this out. <laughs> and we just sit, and like yeah. a lot of us just sitting there. <laughs> can you believe this? Can you, you believe like, this, this is what we're doing right now. This is my now. job. Like, that you can enjoy what you do, but still, it makes you work harder. It makes you strive further, you know? And so when we get that artwork in and we go through it every week and we're looking, okay, this is where we've been, this is where we're going, we've got a big long-term plan. One of the difficulties I think with comic book publishing right now is a lot of publishers are tepid about their commitment. They want it to be successful and then they'll extend it. But in a lot of cases, it can't be successful because you've already cut it in the crib. And Heroic Signature has made a very clear mandate to me. They said, we want a writing partner who is dedicated and we want a long-term commitment on the book so that we can make something big and we can make something that continues strongly and hopefully becomes evergreen as an entry point for a new fandom or returning fandom. And so I know I've got at least two years on the book on a monthly title. I can myth build, I can world build, I can make this thing as big as what it deserves to be, and hopefully a hell of a lot more. And, and that was to give you the opportunity to do that. Yeah. Because as a writer, you, you should have that. You should have that right. That because, is wishful thinking in the modern right? era of comic I mean, publishing. Who knows, it really who is. Knows, like, you know, get this one because issue two would cut, I guess. <laughs> right? I don't no. think so. <laughs> but like, you know, um, from the editorial perspective, um, we wanted to give you that. Yeah that fun and, and, and to explore, I know, you know, just from our speaking, that there are things that you want to figure out with the yep. character and there's places that you'd like to go and say, all right, let's push him in this direction and that's going to take time. Yep. So that's what we wanted to be able to give you like, hey, look, man, as long as you want it. And so we go. planned out the first two years really solid so I can foreshadow things. You can read the first, you know, four issues and get a complete adventure story. But by the time we get to end of year one, you're going to realize we were setting up plot points and elements that you didn't realize were important. So you're going to get more out of it as and, you read. And we hope you're paying attention to the panels along the way, too, because, I mean, it's gorgeous art. But it we're is. giving you the clues. It's a stunner. Yeah. Great. Thank you both. And everybody check out Conan number one from Titan. And heroic signatures. <laughs> and heroic signatures for the record. Thank you. Thank you, gentlemen.